Duncan came from Smith, Smith Wigglesworth. <laughs> Grab your Bibles, open to Romans chapter 8. I'm going to release a couple of bombs in the room that you can chew on before we go into worship. Man, how many guys are just thankful that the presence of God comes when we, when we lift him up? Amen. My wife and I have been in deep studies. We're in, some, we're in school. Anyways, I'll leave it at that. But we just studied the Trinity. I know it sounds huge. It'll bend your mind. How many of you guys know God, you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? And the Holy Spirit is just as much God as the Father is God. And Jesus is just as much God as the Father is God. They're, they're equal and they all came from the same substance. They're not three different gods. Like God the Father who's at the throne, Jesus is at his right hand, and the Holy Spirit is here of the same substance. What's on the Father's mind is also on the mind of the Holy Spirit. What's on the Spirit's mind is also on the mind of Jesus. They are one. We serve one God. Amen. So we can boldly approach his throne of grace to find mercy in our time of need. Amen. Amen. Smith Wigglesworth once said, if it is in the Bible, it is so. <laughs> it's not even to be prayed about. It's to be received and acted upon. Inactivity is a robber which steals blessings. Increase comes by action, by using what we have and know. Your life must be one of going from faith to faith. Tonight, we're going to go from faith to faith. We're going to enter God's courts. We're going to enter the courts of heaven and give God praise. We're not starting to worship. We're going to join the worship that's already happening around the throne of God. We're going to exalt the Lord together. Holy Spirit's here to do miracles, to lift up Jesus, to reveal who he is. We got baptisms happening in just a minute. Where people are going to be dedicating their lives to the Lord, breaking old covenants with the world, with Satan, with the flesh, with the, all that stuff, and making a covenant with God. They're going from a kingdom of darkness to light. Tonight's going to be a powerful night. The Holy Spirit is already here. How many of you guys came expecting for God to move? Amen. Our eyes are on Jesus. We're here expecting for you to move. Woo. Just put your hand on your heart and say, get me, God. <laughs> just put your hand on your neighbor and just say, get them too. <laughs> Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you, God. Psalms 24, verse 7 says, Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, that the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord mighty, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors. The King of glory will come in. Who is this King of glory? He is Yahweh. The Lord of hosts, the King of glory. Look at your neighbor around you. Just greet somebody and tell them the King of glory is here. The King of glory is here. Just give somebody a hug. Tell them the King of glory is here.
Hello, amen. Just raise your hands in this place. The Lord is here. You are the house, you are the dwelling place, you are the temple that the Holy Spirit has chosen to fill. And we shout out to you, O Lord, we shout out to you, O Lord, that you would choose us, your children, to come and dwell and rest. We're gonna go into a time of baptisms, but before we do, I just want you to shout out His name, for He is marking you tonight. He is bringing you in, just lift Him up. Lift up, you Jesus, oh, you holy gates. We love you, Lord. 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 It's because of you, Lord, that we are gathered in this holy place. Thank you, Jesus. If you're already encountering Him and just stay in that place, but we're gonna go into a time of baptisms and we're gonna celebrate what it means to be baptized tonight. We do this every month. We invite our church family and those in our school and in our ministries to come and be baptized and we're gonna celebrate what that means. And then we're gonna go back into worship. And we've just been in the back room out there just the last hour and a half going through a teaching and scripture on baptisms. And I want you guys to know there's a group tonight who are making an outward and public declaration to be baptized. And in their hearts over the coming The the last days and weeks and months and maybe even years, the Lord has been moving in them to get them to this place, right? It's a journey, amen. And we're gonna celebrate as one big family as each one of our brothers and sisters goes down into the water as a public declaration before all of you, their church family, that they've chosen to come into the family of God and to live as one with the Savior. Amen. And when they rise up out of the water, they're gonna come up one with Christ, cleansed. And we've been in the back room and we've been praying and learning about the scriptures and there's been a time of repentance and before the Lord, amen. And now there's the public party, right? Where we get to say, this is who I'm choosing to follow. It's a decision to leave every other life, every idol, every belief, every stronghold, every way every other God, every other religion and choose to follow Christ. He is the way, He is the only way, He is the one. He is the only one who died and rose again for us to be one with Christ, reconnected to the Father through the blood. And I pray tonight as you watch and you hear their testimonies that you would be stirred in your spirit, that either you'd be reminded of your own baptism when you were baptized in water and baptized in the spirit and that you would celebrate them and that you'd also be reminded that there's a whole world out there that we're called to reach. It says, go therefore and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit and go to the nations. That you would be reminded of the call that's on you, the conviction that what's been given to you is not just for you, but it's to be given away. And it will never run dry. The Lord's presence, His love will never run dry. Oh, I feel the Lord in this place. Acts 2.38 says, turn away from every other thing that you have put your trust to save yourself and turn to Jesus and follow Him. Repent and be baptized. So I'm gonna ask you guys to just sit wherever you are. If you're down the front, stay where you are, just grab a seat. And as I ask these guys to come up and share their testimony of why they're being baptized, we're gonna celebrate them wildly. And then we're gonna go back into corporate worship. Amen. Yes, please. Can you take that? Thank you, friend. And you guys get to cheer, okay, and celebrate Bethel Church. Do we celebrate and honor well? Yeah, we do. Tell me your name and why you're being baptized. I'm Naomi. Say that louder. I'm Naomi. And why are you being baptized? Um, I've been living for the world, and now I want to live for God and Jesus. Thank you, Naomi. Give it up. Awesome. Hi, your name and why you're being baptized. Hi, my name is Priya, and I just want to like dedicate my life to God and like be fully surrendered to Him. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Priya. I'm gonna come to you. 
your name and why you're being baptized. Angelica Karstensen, I came here on April 30th and I just felt the spirits move so heavily on me. And I have just been looking forward to this moment ever since. I just wanna give my life completely to Christ. Amen, thank you, Angelica, thank you. Isn't that awesome? She's been feeling, who else has been feeling the spirit move in? Yeah, amen. Come up here. Your name and why you're being baptized tonight. My name is Hannah and um, I tonight choose to be baptized because I have known what it's like to live independent from the Lord. And I can tell you that living in dependency on the Lord is everything to me. And I declare that this is a season for me of saturation, of immersion, of union with the Father that he has been fighting for my whole life. So I wanna, I wanna get that time. Amen, amen, thank you. Woo, if you have dry eyes, good luck. <laughs> Come up here, Jemima, hi. Why are you being baptized? Oh, you got some fans. Um, I fully gave my life to Jesus about just under two years ago in my bedroom. And I grew up in a Christian family, so I was too scared to get baptized. I thought it was wrong. Um, and I was kind of afraid. And two months ago, the Lord delivered me from fear, so I'm not afraid anymore. <laughs> Thank you, Jemima. Some of you received that testimony for yourselves. Your name and why you're being baptized. My name is Chantal Gutierrez. <laughs> I've been getting baptized because I've known the Lord my entire life and I'm ready to break the alabaster jar and just dive in deeper and know him more. <laughs> Keep going, I feel like just share that a little, one minute on that, just what the Lord's doing. The Lord has been speaking to me about the significance of water. And anytime you look in the Bible, you're gonna see blood and water. You can never see any, anything without blood in the water. And he's just showing me that the depths are scary sometimes, but they require sacrifice. And the sacrifice is leaning in more. Whether that means leaving your old life behind, leaving the, the thoughts and the opinions of people behind to dive in deeper because he is worth every sacrifice. He is worth your yes. Thank you, amen. Wow. This is good, hey? Yeah your name and why you're being baptized. Hi, my name is Sarah and I'm from Texas and I, I never thought I would step out of Texas any time in my life. And <laughs> and, and I have been through so many valleys to get here. And I, I, <laughs> This family is just so beautiful. And God called me to join BSSM. And I'm getting baptized because God's already delivered me from so much. And I'm celebrating new beginnings. <laughs> Amen, thank you. Come on, your name and why you're being baptized. All right, uh, my name is Caleb and uh, <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> I'm getting baptized because uh, I feel like God's calling me uh, into a deeper relationship with him. And uh, he's been con confirming to me a lot recently uh, that I've been living in the shallow. And uh, uh, he told me uh, in the last week that I need to uh, fall in love with him uh, and seek, seek him first. So that's so why I'm getting baptized. Come on, first step, come on, amen. I feel the water level rising, hey, in here. Your name and why you're being baptized. Haley. Haley, yes. Um, I want to be baptized because I'm ready to give my life to the Lord. I love that. Haley, I'm going to ask you to do something really brave, and I'm going to stand right beside you. You told me why you want to be baptized. Let's tell these guys. Ready? Do you want to look out with me? I'm right beside you. 
There you go, you got this girl. <laughs> Say my name. My name is Haley, and I'm ready to give my life to the Lord. And I just want you to look at everyone celebrating you like crazy. Go for it, guys. Thanks, Haley. And one more. Oh, you look excited. Your name and why you're being baptized. Uh, my name's Logan. I, I grew up Roman Catholic, and so I was baptized as a baby. But uh, I just want to make the choice as a young man to do it. So, yeah. I love that. Thank you. You can stand up, guys. Wasn't that incredible? Wow, I just want to let you know that we have extra t-shirts and we have extra towels. And if your heart's been stirred by the testimonies tonight of our friends and family being baptized and it hasn't been something you've had the chance or the opportunity to do, I want to invite you to come join them tonight. We would love the honour of baptising you and leading you through the prayer of baptism and leading you into that relationship with Him. And I also want you to know if your heart's stirring and you're in this place and you're like, I don't know the Lord. I don't know this Jesus you're talking about. I don't know this intimacy, this man that wants a relationship with me called Jesus. I want you to know He is real. He's more real today than ever. And He's been seeking you out. He knows your name. He knows your background. He knows who you're, where you're from. He knows where you're going and He wants to meet with you. So I want you to know nobody, no matter where you've come from, what you've been through, what you've done, What's written against your life? There's not one of you in this place that the Lord doesn't desire to bring close and come into relationship with. And we're gonna be over in this corner. We have a whole team that would love to pray for you and lead you through that salvation prayer and celebrate, right church? And celebrate wildly what the Lord is doing. So please come join us. It would be the biggest honor for us to pray you through the prayer. So as we go back into a time of worship, I just want you to set your hearts on the Lord. Tonight is about Him and celebrating Him and just close your eyes and lift your hands as we go back into the song of praise and worship and just remember you're here tonight because of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
Everything changed It's getting harder to recognize The person I was Before I encountered Christ I don't walk like I used to I don't talk like I used to I was washed from the inside I've been washed from the inside out When my shame hit the wayside 
In my sin met the most high I was washed from the inside I was washed from the inside out
we thank you for the blood. You're worthy of our praise. Mm. We thank you for your blood. Respond in your own words to the Lord. Come on, let's lift up our own song to Jesus. Lift up your own song to the Lamb of God. Fix your eyes on Jesus tonight.
His blood for us, rising to the highest throne in heaven. Oh, 
Treasures and crowns down at your feet. Honor and fame only belong to you. You are before everything, grasping it all together.
Would you put your hands out in front of you? Holy Spirit, would you restore to us the joy of our salvation? Beautiful King Jesus, would you restore to us the great joy of our salvation? Father, would you restore to us your joy of our salvation? All throughout worship, I kept hearing that phrase, restore to me, Psalms 51, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Tonight, I feel like there's two groups in the room. We've been singing about the gospel message. We've been hearing people publicly proclaim in the public demonstration of baptisms, going into the grave and being resurrected out of the waters. Tonight, I feel like there's two groups of people here. I don't usually do this, but I feel like there's people who have never given their lives to the Lord tonight. That's the first group. If you're in this room and you have never had an encounter with that cross, you've never had an encounter with the person of Jesus and fully surrendered and made Jesus your Lord and your Savior, both. He saves you from your sin, then you bend your knee and you make him Lord of your life. We need both. If you've never done that in a public way, and you feel something in your heart tonight, I wanna make space for you to see Jesus. It's between you and him. Actually, can you close your eyes in this space? We don't, we usually leave our eyes open. I think we're supposed to close our eyes. If that's you in this room and you know if I'm talking to you or not, and you need joy in your life, you need to meet the person of joy, and you've never made space for that encounter with the Lord, You've never said, here's my heart. And this is your first time doing that tonight. Can you just be boldly raise your hand? Raise your hand in this place if that's you. Come on, hallelujah. Anyone else? Amen. Anyone else? Thank you, Lord. Church, would you just pray this with me? All together, we can all pray this again. <laughs> Holy Spirit, I give you my life, my entire life, not just one part, all of it. I repent for my sins, and I invite your Holy Spirit into my heart. Take my life, cover me in your blood. I turn from my ways, and I choose you this day become Lord and Savior of my life. Amen. If you gave your life to the Lord for the first time tonight, there's gonna be a group of people lying in the front at the end of the service. I would love for you to come down and have them pray with you and take your name and get your contact information. The second group is those of you who have the salvation of the Lord, but you need the restoration of joy. Joy is not shallow, it's deep. It's not blind, it's not deaf to what's going on in your life. But when you open your eyes and you open your ears to what's going on and you trade in your sorrows for joy, you're restored to the joy of your salvation. Tonight, if you need a fresh baptism of the Spirit of God in your heart, if you're hungry for something more, it's probably all of us, but I feel like there's gonna be a particular group that has a quickening in their spirits. If that's you tonight, and you're like, I need a restoration of joy, I need a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. If that's you in this place and you're hungry and you need something in particular tonight, would you just be bold enough to raise your hand in this place? Come on. Beautiful kings. Tonight, if you don't have your hand up, would you reach a hand on someone that surrounds you that has their hand up? And we're just gonna look at Jesus. I actually don't want you to pray. I just want you to place your hand on them. And every eye in this room is gonna be set on Jesus right now. Holy Spirit, right now, we look to you. Every eye in this room, we look to you. I ask for the restoration of the joy of your salvation coming back. Right now, if you need to look at circumstances in your life, 
I want you to literally place that circumstance figuratively in front of you. If you're watching on Bethel TV, place that circumstance figuratively, metaphorically in front of you and look square in the face. Look at the circumstance that you need Jesus, that you need breakthrough, you need restoration, you need redemption. And now I want you to lift your eyes just above that to find the face of Jesus. Lift your eyes to the hills. Where does your help come from? Psalm 51, restore to me the joy of my salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I'll teach your transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt, O God, and my tongue shall sing aloud your righteousness and your praise. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall pour forth your praise. Holy Spirit, I ask for a restoration of joy in this house. <laughs> Not a shallow joy, but a deep joy. Not a hand over your face or a fingers in your ears joy, but a fully aware and a choosing to lift your eyes higher to where your help comes from. Restore, redemption restore. Families be redeemed, bodies be healed. Heavy hearts would you lift right now in the beautiful name of Jesus. We love you, Lord. Can we sing that bridge again, Mari? Unto the land, unto the land. Let's just sing this. This beautiful man who reigns forever. Glory to God in the highest. Every eye set on him. Set your eyes we on him. Praise you unto the lamb. Unto the lamb. Unto the lamb. This beautiful man who reigns forever. Glory to God in the highest. We praise you. Unto the lamb. other name we say unto your name unto the Lamb of God restore to us the joy of our salvation the deep deep in our spirits and our guts knowing joy of our salvation we love you beautiful. 
beautiful Jesus with all of our hearts, all of our souls, our mind, all of our strength. We love you, Lord. Just say that with your own words. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. You have the words of life. Where else will we go? Where else will we go? In the beautiful name of Jesus. And everybody said, Guys, why don't you give a hug to someone around you? You can find your way back to your seats. Bethel TV, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It is an honor to have you with us all over the world. Go ahead and find your seats, guys. Now we're going to turn our attention to the church news. Hi, Bethel family. We've got some updates for you. Here's this week's church news. Applications are now open for Bethel Music College's new artistry program. The online program will offer you the skills you need to accomplish your songwriting goals and walk more equipped for your calling. Apply today at Bethel.com slash church news. Sunday, September 17th is Vision Sunday for our new Collier campus. Join us in person or online and hear exciting updates about this project and catch the vision for the future. We'll see you there. Check out these upcoming Equip classes. These are just a few of the incredible classes we're offering this fall, so be sure to visit Bethel.com slash Equip to see the full list. Up From the Ashes, taught by Brian Nickens, will impart valuable kingdom strategies to help you navigate the complexities of today's world with confidence in God's wisdom. For those engaged or in a relationship moving towards marriage, join Aaron and Jenna Zent at the Pre-Married Lab and prepare for a healthy and thriving marriage. Join Studies in the Sermon on the Mount and explore one of the most read passages of Scripture with Will McIver and receive fresh revelation for walking with Jesus. Join the Destiny Lab class with Jeff and Sherry Whitmer to discover your God-given dreams, giftings, and passions as you learn through practical steps and activations. I have been waiting to make this announcement because this is one of my most favorite events of the year. And it's not just because I attend it every year. I'm a part of it every year. It's because God moves every year. Young Saints Conference is coming up and we're so expectant for what God is about to do in the youth. Watch this short video to learn more. The differences between kids then and kids now is that the war for their attention, the war on their identity, on the sexuality of this generation and on who they are has been supercharged demonically. And I'm telling you right now, God is about to mark Gen Z with his fire and his glory. And they're gonna be rising up as deliverers to speak to their generation and deliver them from the demonic clutches that will be powerless in the midst of a preached gospel. I feel like the Holy Spirit is about to show us a revelation of Jesus that would be so marking that it would create this hunger that's sustainable in your everyday life to know God. I want to encourage you right now. God has actually called young people to rise up and reconcile the world to Him. Jesus is still the answer. He's always been the answer, and He will be the answer in every generation in the future. My hope for this event is that we would set a table where you could come and sit and meet with Jesus. The most hardened and confused kids will encounter God will be transformed and will become the voice for their generation. I wanna encourage you right now that if you are sitting in your room 
if you're watching this on a screen, wherever you are at, it is time to realize you are part of a bigger plan. God has not forgotten you. He knows where you're at, what you're doing, and he is ready to charge you with authority and anointing to step into everything he has for you. And that's it for this week's church news. Yes. If you missed any of these announcements, visit Bethel.com slash church news to learn more. Have an amazing week. So good. Man, Gen Z, look out. The Lord is coming for you. Um, we're going to welcome a first-time guest. If you are visiting for the very first time, I want to celebrate you and cheer you. Would you mind actually standing for me? If you're visiting for the very first time. Amazing. So good. If you guys could actually stay standing, uh, we're going to hand you a little a card with a coupon to our bookstore. Um, but actually during worship... I felt prophetically, I saw um, each of you visiting for the first time, going home, and I saw you crushing the head of the serpent. And I had this expectation in my heart that, especially around the releasing of joy, that you would go home with a, like an oil of joy that would crush the this, this serpent's head, and that this would be a season of radical breakthrough. So, church, if you wouldn't mind extending your hands, if you're around them, you can lay your hands on these visitors. And I want you just to pray breakthrough over them in Jesus' name. Lord, we ask that this would be a season of unprecedented breakthrough for these guests, Lord, that as they go back home, things that they have been contending for, breakthroughs that they have been praying for, Lord, we ask that we would see incredible, incredible answers to prayer, that it would be a season that would mark them, Lord, mark the reality of who you are, that you are the God of breakthrough. I want you just to pr uh, pray the blood of Jesus over them and over their family, that there wouldn't be a situation, that, that every situation that they're facing would bow their knee to what Jesus has done, that it is finished. Just declare that over them. It is finished in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Thank you, guys. Why don't you give them a, a hand? Thank you, Lord. And uh, there's this beautiful couple over here. Um, I just feel like this is going to be a season where I feel the Holy Spirit taking you into the mind of Christ. Uh, and I saw God uh, taking you into ability to think and dream what he's seeing and what he's doing. Uh, and there's been a beautiful journey where God has led you up to, I feel like in the past five years, uh, where God is about to lead you into everything that you've been asking for. And there's a real anointing on the both of you where I feel like you've truly made God the delight of your heart. And I feel like he's bringing you into a season where he's like, I'm gonna fulfill all your desires. And so just get ready what the preparation of these last five years, yes, God is gonna do something incredibly beautiful. So bless you guys, bless you. Okay, we're gonna do offering. So if we wouldn't mind standing and we're gonna read offering number one. Uh, on Sunday nights, we rush the buckets. So we're gonna have some buckets up front here for you guys to come and give. And there's also gonna be a QR code for everyone online if you wanna give online. And uh, this is a season where I feel like God's generosity is gonna blow us away. So we're gonna read this in faith. Uh, offering reading number one. As we receive today's offering, we are believing the Lord for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interests and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, debts paid off, expenses decrease, 
blessing and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of my financial needs, that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. So if you can hold uh, your tithe or your offering in your hand, I'm just going to pray for you really quick. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that we have the beautiful opportunity to invest into a realm we cannot see. Lord, and we just ask that as we honor you with our finances, God, that you would establish yourself as Lord and that this area of our life would reveal the generosity and the magnificence of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, guys, brush the buckets. you express your thanks to the worship team. Appreciate it so much. You can sit down. Good evening. Glad you showed up. Yesterday, my husband thought he saw a cockroach in the kitchen. He sprayed everything down cleaned thoroughly. Today I'm putting the cockroach in the bathroom. <laughs> my bathing suit told me to go to the gym, but my sweatpants were like, nah, girl, you're good. <laughs> I didn't make it to the gym today. That makes five years in a row. <laughs> there are three kinds of people in this world. Those who are good at math and those who aren't. Spell check has got to be my worst enema. <laughs> Spell check has got to be my worst enema. <laughs> I give you another chance. That's all right. Money may not buy happiness, but I'd rather cry in a Bentley than on a bus. <laughs> I'm sorry for what I said before I had my coffee. <laughs> Three wise women would have asked for directions, arrived on time, helped deliver the baby, cleaned the stable, made a casserole, and there would be peace on earth. <laughs> oh, goodness. I have so many. 
All right, I'll just do one more. When I die, I want my last words to be, I left a million dollars under the... Man, I don't know how many scriptures we're going to read tonight. I hope you have your Bibles with you because we're going to, we're going to do a, a study together and we'll just see how this plays out. Um, I want to start with a thought that is championed in Ephesians chapter 3 and then we're going to back up in the story. But in Ephesians chapter 3 is this passage you know, it's hard to, you know, when you say it's the most mysterious verse, the most profound verse, whatever, I don't know. That's how I feel, but, you know, it's pretty subjective. But for me, this is the most incomprehensible verse in the Bible, which is saying something, because most of them are <laughs> incomprehensible. But he says in verse 19, to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. That you may be filled with the fullness of God. There are planets out there bigger than like our galaxy. Since the day the Lord spoke, let there be light, his word has been traveling through empty space and creating. It's expanding at at least the speed of sound, if not the speed of light. That God holds all of that in the palm of his hand. And he said his intention is to fill us with his fullness. If you don't leak, you're bound way too tight. These are not poetic phrases to inspire us. They are literal decrees that are so far beyond the reach of our imagination that there's no way in the world we can make it happen, nor can we understand it as it's happening. But what we can do is surrender to his intent. I can surrender to his intent. I can acknowledge that acknowledge it in that I see it well what did Paul say through a glass darkly I, I see the shape of it although I could never fully describe it and the Christian life is that it is, it is going from one mystery to another mystery to another mystery and one of the great tragedies especially I think in the western world is we tend to reduce the gospel to what we understand And I, I don't want to put down uh, intellect. Uh, the Lord pr protected human reasoning with his own death. I mean, literally, he protected the capacity of the individual to reason. He even invites us. He says, come and reason. Let's reason together. I believe very strongly that the Lord wants to reveal himself through human intellect, but never contained by human in intellect, if that makes sense. Your heart will take you where your head can't fit. And what the Lord constantly is doing is bringing us into measures and realms and levels of surrender. Because it all has to do with the heart. Why? Because his supreme value is faith. Faith is not anti-intellect. It's just superior to intellect. In Hebrews chapter 11, it says, by faith we understand the worlds were made out of nothing. By faith we understand. Faith first, understanding comes next. 
and the understanding was to perceive something that's beyond comprehension. By faith, we understand the worlds were made out of nothing. The reason that he deals with the heart, because the heart is where faith comes from. It says where the heart man believes. It doesn't say with the head. I, I've gone over this so many times, so forgive me for repeat for, for uh, you old timers. But <clears throat> the mind is important. You'll see uh, Jesus acknowledging the centurion. If you remember the centurion, he acknowledged his extraordinary faith but his faith was revealed through his understanding. His faith was revealed through his understanding of authority. He said, I'm a man under authority, and I say to those under me, go do something, and they do it. So he was giving a picture of the kingdom. It was his understanding that captured Jesus' attention and released a miracle into his servant. Extraordinary story. So faith is not anti-intellect. It just... Um, it's superior. And because it is superior, now realize we've all seen fake faith or attempts at faith that fell far short. And probably most of us have done it. But genuine faith is superior to human reasoning. And it is so superior that it inspires the mind into the mind of Christ. The renewed mind is like banks of a river. It creates the context for faith to flow in. So it's important. Pursuing understanding is important. But I never want to restrict my obedience to my understanding. I don't need to understand to obey. If I restrict my obedience to my understanding, then I've created a God in my image. I have a God who's my size. So it's vital that my obedience is, is ready to go at the word of the Lord. It does not have to make sense to me. I just need to know it's him. <clears throat> it looks like I'm going to be real thirsty tonight. <laughs> Which if this is any sign, it's going to be a long meeting. <laughs> but we will need a break. <laughs> now, both of these are, are unopened bottles. So, I mean, they're pretty full. You know what? I'm just going to do it this way here. I'll just do it with one. Now, this bottle is full enough to sell as full, but it's actually not full. It's pretty full now, but it's still not full. Now it's full. See, fullness is measured in overflow, not by what you contain. Jack Haver taught us years ago that um, abundance in the kingdom is not measured by what you have. It's measured by what you've given away. The same concept exists in the fullness of the Spirit. So when the Scripture talks about us being filled with the Spirit, in fact, there's a commandment. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's actually a command. Fullness is measured in overflow. It's not, it's not what you contain. It's not your... Merry Christmas. You caught it. That's good, because it would have wrecked your iPad. So. Fullness is measured in overflow. And you were designed... Uh, Smith Wigglesworth, would, he, he was a, a, not a tall man in stature, but he would say, I'm a small man ex externally, but I'm a giant inside. There's something about the cap capacity of the human heart to contain more than 
we uh, visibly look like we could contain. I don't know if, that, if I'm saying that right, but I think you at least get what I'm, what I'm implying. The ability of the, of the surrendered soul to house God is beyond anything we could imagine. And you and I were actually designed for this purpose. So Jesus has 12 guys, one flaked out, so he's got 11. <laughs> and he spent three and a half years with them, showing them what it's like to be full of the Spirit. He never put it in those words, but he modeled it so profoundly that they ached for what he had. See, we owe people an encounter with God, and the only way to ensure that that can happen on a continuous daily basis is for us to be full in the same way that I just illustrated, full of the Holy Spirit. We are vessels that leak. We're broken vessels, every one of us, which means I have to stay continuously under the spout that keeps me full. And the downfall of the church is often the fact that we had an experience X amount of weeks, months, or years ago, or decades ago, and we live off the memory of that, but we don't have the, the reality of that present experience. Does it work? It can work. You still have a measure of fruitfulness from what happened a long time ago. Let me give you a strange illustration. A prophet dies, an army's going by, one of their soldiers killed, they throw the dead body of the soldier in on the bones of the prophet. What are the bones of the prophet? It's what used to be. It's where God used to work, was through the man. Those were his bones. So it's, it's, a, whole, it's a whole symbol of something that used to be active that's not active anymore. And yet the glory that remained of what is no longer active is so powerful that it still raised this dead soldier from, from the dead. But sometimes we see how God uses, can I say what used to be? That we become satisfied with what used to be. <coughs> Built entire churches and movements around what used to be. Because occasionally we see somebody raised. One of the Old Testament concepts that is a, a, a strong, a convicting uh, word for me is the fact that in the Old Testament, God lit the fire on the altar, but the priest kept it burning. So if a fire died out, was it God's sovereignty? Or was it the neglect of priests? God's intent was to keep fire going. But if it dies out, it's because somebody stopped putting flammable material on the fire. And the one way to ensure the fire continues is that you become the living offering and you put yourself in the fire and you just say, God, burn in me. So here, let's, um, let's do this. You ready? Yeah. On your marks, get set. Genesis 28. You have your Bibles, right? If you don't have one with you, scoot next to somebody or in some way, um, I want you to see, I want you to see what we're looking at tonight. All right, Genesis chapter 28. Verse 10, now Jacob went out from Beersheba 
and went towards Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. He took one of the stones of that place, put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. And then he dreamed. And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, the north, and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I've done what I've spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. I've been in a lot of church services exactly like that. (laughs) One guy's having a divine encounter, and the guy sitting next to him is wondering when lunch is, you know. God's here, and I didn't even know it. Verse 17, he was afraid. And he said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, the gate of heaven. Read verse 17 again. He was afraid and he said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Stop there for a moment. One of the most fundamental um, kind of principles of Bible interpretation is you pay attention, special attention to the first mention of any subject. Because what it does is it sets a standard that the rest of Scripture kind of is in tune to, if that, if that makes sense. The first mention of the house of God in the Bible is this right here. And there's no building. So what I want you to do as we read through this, I want you to pay attention to the, um, uh, the things that, that help to reveal that this is actually the house of God. All right, so there are, there are indicators. There are uh, things that God has said, this is happening here. And these are the kinds of things that are indicative of the house of God. Now, the house of God is portrayed in Scripture a, a lot. The temple of uh, Solomon, of course, tabernacle of Moses, all those things. But the only one that represents the body of Christ, the New Testament temple of God, is the tabernacle of David. All the others were, some, were for something else. The tabernacle of Moses, a brazen altar, it's where blood was shed. A laver, it's where uh, they wa- the priests would wash themselves with water. What came out of Jesus' side? Water. Blood and water. That's in the outer court. They come in and we've got the table of showbread, we've got the candlestick, we have the altar of incense. On the other side, we have a mercy seat, Ark of the Covenant. So what do we have here? We have a cross, number one. Number two, Jesus is the blood offering. Jesus is the word, the washing of the water. He is the showbread. He is the bread of life, the light of the world, the candlestick. He is the great intercessor, and he is the God of all mercy. So this whole tabernacle was a prophetic picture of Jesus, not of the church. But interestingly, while there's no building here, this revelation reveals the nature of the house of God, unlike, in some ways, unlike any other scripture in the Bible. Okay? Verse 17 again. And he was afraid and he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So that tells us, number one, that the house of God is a gate. What is a gate in the natural? What is a gate? A gate, uh, you may have a gate from your, uh, from your backyard to your driveway. You may have a gate from your front yard to the public sidewalk. The point is, is it's a passageway from one reality to another. All right? Are you alive? Yeah. You're thinking and everything? All right. 
So, so this then says that the house of God is the gate of heaven, which means it's a gate placed on the edge of two realities. What did we see earlier? It said the ladder says the angels were ascending and descending on it. Going and coming. What is the gate? It's a passageway between two realities. Heaven and earth and the church is the gate. Verse 18, Jacob arose early in the morning. He took a stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar, poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. That's kind of cool. <laughs> but the name of the city had been Luz previously. Luz, by the way, is, uh, uh, it, it comes from a word that means almonds. So the name was changed from Luz to Bethel. Luz, house of nuts, to, a house, <laughs> to the house of God. So there's, there's still a few nuts here. But... Uh, Verse 20, Jacob made a vow saying, if God be with me, keep me in this way that I'm going, give me bread to eat, clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, and the Lord shall be my God. This stone which I have set up as a pillar shall be God's house. New Testament, we are built together as living stones. So this is a prophetic picture. What do we have here? If you take the entire passage that we just read, we have number one, we have an open heaven. Remember, the Father spoke, right? Angels ascending and descending. All right. Go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 43. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip, and he said to him, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's interesting. Uh, Jesus wasn't offended by his sarcasm. Philip said to him, come and see. Nathaniel coming toward him said of him, behold, excuse me, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming towards him and he said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit, no guile. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. I love seeing the gifts of the Spirit functioning through Jesus because we, we sometimes don't realize, you know, that we have access to the exact same thing. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. It's interesting. Can anything good come out of Nazareth too? Rabbi, you are the son of God. That's, that's, that's a pretty dramatic shift, you know. Just a short conversation changed everything. Nathaniel answered and said, Rabbi, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Here's the, what I wanted to, uh, to read here. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under a fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open, angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And I saw a ladder on the earth reach to heaven, and angels were ascending and descending. You'll see greater things than these. 
you will see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Why is that significant? A few verses earlier, actually in verse 14 of chapter 1, the scripture says, Jesus is the Word of God made flesh. One of the uh, ways it's described is, is Jesus, the Word of God made flesh. Jesus is the house of God, or God tabernacled among us in Christ. So what is Jesus is the initial model or illustration of what God intends to do in the New Testament church. So Jesus is the tabernacle of God, the dwelling place of God on earth. He introduces himself, I'm the light of the world. But before he left, he said to you and to me, he says, you're the light of the world. It's not that we take his place. It's that he extends what he carried to the believing human race. And not to not step, to not at least attempt to step fully into what Jesus was, what he illustrated and modeled is to miss the point. So here, Jesus announces to Nathaniel and the guys that are there that you're going to see greater things than me calling you out by a word of knowledge that I saw you under a fig tree. And of course they did. But they, they saw, whether they saw visibly angels coming and going, they saw the effect of the angelic realm partnering with Jesus. Now, God can do everything himself and never need an angel. But don't be stupid and argue against his design. Because he can also do everything without you and me. And he can do everything better. He could stand on planet earth and speak in such a way that everybody on the entire planet would hear him in their language. And it would be much more convincing than what you and I do. The point isn't what is God capable of doing. The point is what is his plan. His plan is to take broken, redeemed humanity and use them in such a way that only God can get the credit for what gets accomplished. Amen. His longing from day one was, was co-laboring. It was the partnership between him and people. So Jesus then was the prototype of what the body of Christ was to look like. We are called the body of Christ for a reason. The Bible says the government will rest upon his shoulders, not his head. The Bible says that that everything, Ephesians chapter 1, every power, every dominion, every ruler, every name, everything is put under his feet. It doesn't say under his chin. The mind of Christ is actually to take the things he has declared to be true and cooperate in our thinking with what he says to be true, even though you don't feel it. It's not mind over matter. It's not getting hyped and psych yourself out. It's not that. It's coming to agreement with what he says. Many people cancel the prayer they just prayed. As soon as they're done, they say something that actually cancels it. It happens all the time. All the time. I'm not into pretending, so don't misunderstand me here, but I... You know, somebody will come and, and uh, ask for prayer and uh, let's, let's say they need, you know, some part of their body healed. So I pray for them. And as soon as I'm done praying, they will say, I know he can do it, which is religious yeah. decree that basically said, I know he didn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's the way to sound spiritual, but actually express unbelief. 
sometimes we, we protect things that shouldn't be protected. Protecting unbelief, protecting uh, compromise in thought or whatever. And, and the, the best way to do it is just, is just create a spiritual term. <laughs> it, it, listen, it's, it's done a lot by all of us, and uh, you know, uh, just just a, you know somebody who's uh, somebody who is uh, Someone who's real critical of another person rarely admits that they're critical. They instead will say, well, I have a real call from God to pursue justice. Because then we can hide our dysfunction under a spiritual virtue. And any dysfunction that we protect is hard to be dealt with. And it it actually sets down roots till it begins to shape our personality. You all right? I have more, so I, I hope you're able. I, I hope you're able. To, yeah, oh, I hope you're able to. You know what? Let's just do it this way. If you get done before I do, just go home. Just, just go home. Um, their unrenewed mind. Um, the unrenewed mind does tricky things with the condition of our own heart. Do you understand that the condition of your heart actually influences what you think? Do you understand that the condition of your heart actually influences what you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that's very spontaneous. It touched me. It touched me. If I have a bitter heart, and I don't deal with it, it will convince my mind that it has a gift of discernment. Now, that doesn't apply to you, but there's a church somewhere in town that needs that one. You understand what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's that, that condition of the heart that gets unchecked, not just checked, but repented of. It has to be abandoned. You don't you don't waltz your way out of sin. You abandon. You, you, you confess, you renounce, you turn from. It's not something we, you know, I'm, I'm only going to be bitter once a day now for the next month, and then I'll go to every other day. And you, you don't wean yourself from sin. You abandon sin. You, any sin that you try to wean yourself from is, uh, is going to become a close friend. If I've got anxiety and fear in my heart and it plagues me and I don't deal with it, but I protect it, that anxious heart will convince my mind it's not moving in fear, it's moving in wisdom. If I have an impure heart, it will influence my mind to think it's not lust. I'm just not bound by religion. I'm displaying freedom. It's the reason 
Proverbs 4, the heart of wisdom is this exhortation, watch over your heart with all diligence because from it flow the issues of life. Keeping that central theme of your life is to remain tender. I've gotten off subject. So let's, let's uh, it, it's a good subject, but it's just off subject. So uh, let's do this. Go to John chapter 20. And Luke 24. Okay, so we'll have those two chapters open. Now, the 11 remaining disciples are here in verse 19. The same day at evening, being the first day of the week, where the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst, and he said to them, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed his hands, them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So they weren't glad when they first saw him because they didn't know who, know who he was. They were terrified. First of all, they're hiding because they're afraid they're going to be killed by the Jews. They're hiding, and then somebody walks through the wall. <laughs> it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't help the issues of fear you know, when somebody just appears through the wall, and that's what happened. And so they, they aren't having it. They're, you can imagine. I mean, you can imagine. They, are, they were terrified already. Now they're terrified, <laughs> terrified on steroids. I mean, they are terrified. And so Jesus shows his hands and his side. They realize who he is. Because remember, when Jesus appears over and over and over again, he appears as other constantly, differently. Road to Emmaus, they had walked with him for years, but they didn't recognize him. Because we're to recognize him not by external appearance. We're to recognize him by spirit. If you just do it by externals, then he has to meet certain qualifications for you to recognize him. People do the same with revival. Certain ways a revival should look like. And then he comes along and he does joy. And a lot of people couldn't, just couldn't handle it. They, they, they couldn't see in Scripture that in his presence is fullness of joy. It just didn't compute. Because what this people needs is to be on their faces repenting. And yet God gave them joy and they rejoiced out of their lifestyle of sin. It was different than what everybody expected. When you learn to recognize by presence, not by externals, then you realize who's in charge. <clears throat> so here we have... Uh, he showed them his hands and his side, verse 20. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So the, the 11 disciples, remaining disciples, received the Holy Spirit in John chapter 20. The indwelling, born-again experience was made available to the disciples in John 20. <sighs> he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. He's not doing a symbolic act. Everything he did was very calculated and intentional. In Luke chapter 24, before Jesus ascended to heaven for the, for the final time before Pentecost, he said in verse 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry or wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power on high, from on high. What's the point? They received the Holy Spirit in John 20. But before Jesus ascended to the Father, he told the guys, stay in Jerusalem till you're clothed with power. 
There was the indwelling, but there was the clothing. There was the baptism. Biblically, they can happen at the same time, but the initial revelation was they are two distinct experiences. Jesus, I've been having you turn to every scripture. I usually just quote them, but I've been finding people need to see it in their Bibles. So go to Matthew 28. Go to Matthew 28. I say people, you and I, we, we, need, to, we need to see sometimes, you know, even if we can quote it, you know. <clears throat> now, when did I start? How long do I? I? I know there's no limit, but I still want to know how long. I started at 740, about, did I? Jeez, I've been talking a long time. Jeez. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Some of you are rejoicing. Others are going, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Now, you remember when Jesus chose the 12, he met with them, and it says he gave them power and authority. Do you remember that? It's in Luke 9. He gave them power and authority. I like to describe it this way. <clears throat> Jesus came commissioned from the Father, so he had all authority. When he was baptized in water, he came up out of the water and was clothed with the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit rested upon him in the form of a dove and remained. So I like to, I like to put it this way. Jesus came to earth, having been commissioned from the Father to come take our place in death and be the sacrifice. He came with authority. I don't think he came with power. Now, as God, obviously, he's got all power. But the point is, as he chose self-imposed restrictions to live with the limitations of a human being, although he has access to everything as God. Make sense? Kind of? All right. So he came with what? Authority. How do we know? Because the authority comes in, your, the authority you walk in is equal to the, your submission to the commission. Authority is directly connected to the commission. I think Chris Valentin is the one who put it this way first. He said, co-missioned. You have to be in submission to the primary mission. That's how you're co-missioned. All right, does that make sense? So he came to earth with authority because he was commissioned by the Father. But he still needed to be clothed with power. And so he comes to John for water baptism. John says, I'm not worthy to untie your shoes. Jesus says, permit it. He baptized him in water. The Spirit of God comes upon him in the form of a dove and remains. So there he receives power. If you read in Luke chapter, the end of chapter 3, the beginning of chapter 4, it was after that water baptism where the Spirit of God came upon him. It was after that power was displayed, but not until then. All right? Now, fast forward. Jesus is at the end of his life. He's already commissioned the 12. There's 11 left. He's already given them power and authority. But what does he do? After he dies, he resurrects. He appears to them. And in Matthew 28, Jesus came and spoke to them, verse 18, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. What are some of the things he commanded? Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. Here in the Great Commission, he's saying, teach your disciples what I commanded you, which includes healing and deliverance and all, all the other things. Yeah? I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So the point I want to make is even though all 12 of his disciples, 11 remaining, even though they had already been given power 
and authority when Jesus was, was on earth. I like to put it this way. They were deputized under his mantle of anointing, of call of anointing, his power and authority. So they functioned under the umbrella of his gift. I've seen it happen, so I, I, we don't have, I, I, I could take time, but Absolutely. I'd end up killing all of you. So, so <laughs> but but I've, I've seen it where, where you work with someone in their gift and, and their anointing actually affects you. And as long as you're with them, you function like them. And you think you've got it, and then you try to do it on your own. And, <laughs> It doesn't work well. It's, 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 it's like a wake-up call. Oh, so, so that anointing wasn't mine. Yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah. It's, it just, you, you, have, you, just, you just pay a price for those things, that's all. And uh, so anyway, um, so here's Jesus. He comes back, and he, the first thing he does is he tells them they have authority. Well, I thought they already had authority. Yeah, they were deputized under his but now they've got to have their own. So what does he do? First thing he does <clears throat> is he appears to them. He says, all authority has been given to me, therefore go. What is he doing? He's imparting authority for the mission. The great co-mission. And then he says, don't leave Jerusalem until you're clothed with power. I thought they already had power. Yeah, they were deputized. Now they have to get their own. Now they have to get their own. You remember Jesus told his disciples, it's better for you that I go. I doubt there was one disciple that believed that. <laughs> because they've got him right there. I mean, they've got him right there. They can ask him anything. He corrects them. It's, you know, it's the only time they were embarrassed and felt good about it. You know, it's, it's like Jesus just adjusted stuff in their lives. And it was just continuous. And he said, it's better that I go. And then he made this, Jesus made this statement, John, I think it's 14. He says, the Holy Spirit who, his, who is with you will be in you. The Spirit of God who is with you will be in you. And that's what he was announcing. So in John 20, he breathed on them. They received the Holy Spirit. And then he said, but we're not done. Don't leave Jerusalem until you've been clothed with power. <clears throat> One of the kind of bizarre stories in scriptures of Gideon I won't have you turn to this one. It's in chapter 7 or 8. I think it's chapter 8. It's on the right-hand side of the page, but it's right at the top, first column. <laughs> and it says, in my translation, New, New King James says, and the Spirit of God came upon Gideon, and it was an extraordinary feat that was accomplished. But in the footnote, it says, literally, it means the Holy Spirit clothed himself with Gideon. I said I wasn't going to turn there, but some of you don't believe me, so I'm going <laughs> to. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. He blew the trumpet. The soldiers gathered to him, etc. It says, the Spirit of the Lord clothed himself with Gideon. If an Old Testament concept of the Holy Spirit clothing. Uh, it was Michael Thompson who told us this 20, probably seven, 28 years ago. He said, the Holy Spirit in this passage put Gideon on like a glove. That's what we need. Yeah. It's for the Spirit of God to put us on like a glove. It's got to fit well. That glove can't have a mind of its own. That glove can't have a preconceived idea. This is what it needs to look like. 
It's actually, it's got to be supple, tender, very flexible. So as the Holy Spirit puts you on, puts me on, he does what he wants. So he tells them in Luke 24, don't leave Jerusalem until you've been clothed with power. Now let's go to Acts chapter 1. And I'll start, I'll start wrapping this up. Now remember, we started uh, this thing tonight by just this one concept, this most difficult to comprehend concept of God wanting to fill us with his fullness. I can't think about that very long because it will hurt my head. (laughs) So Acts chapter 1, remember, uh, now Acts is written by Luke, as was the gospel of Luke. A great way to to, uh, read those two books is actually back to back. And uh, it, it picks up in chapter 1 of Acts right where Luke 24 left off. Luke 24 says, stay in Jerusalem till you're clothed with power. We come to Acts chapter 1. You know what? We're just reading a lot of scripture today. Chris, Chris read about 40 passages this morning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat him tonight. We're going to read. I'm, I'm teasing you, but I, 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 it's not always. No, never mind. Verse 1. We'll just start with verse 1. I usually go right to the heart of it, but we're just, I'm just going to drag it on. <clears throat> verse 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach. I love that. I like Mark. In fact, I underline most any time I see do and teach in the same uh, breath, I mark them. Because in our culture, doing and teaching are separate things. In our culture, you can be taught by someone who doesn't do. You can take business classes from someone who doesn't own a business. And it's actually, it's common in our culture because we elevate knowledge concepts above experience. John Wimber brought an amazing example years, years ago in his book, Power Evangelism. I think that's the one, Power Evangelism. But he gave this illustration of uh, the el- uh, elderly Chinese people were given a questionnaire. And first of all, there was statements made, and then there was a question. I forget all of them, but there's this one that made the point. A statement was made. Coffee doesn't grow in cold climate. Second statement. England has cold climate. Question. Does coffee grow in England? The Western mind, that answer is easy. But for especially the older Chinese generation, when they were asked, does coffee grow in England? Their answer was, we don't know. We've never been there. Because the Eastern culture focuses on the value of experience, where the Western culture elevates concept where you don't even need experience. And so we have intellectual Christians that don't have a relationship. (laughs) Philosophic believers. And I'm not trying to shame anyone. I'm just trying to say, we, we just need to realize the challenges. It's not them, it's us. The challenges that we have in learning. And so when he says, here's an account, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach. It's important. It's not a casual comment. Nicodemus came to Jesus and said, we know that you're a teacher come from God because no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. We know you're a teacher, there's the word, because no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. There's the teaching and doing. It's all through the scripture. All right. Until the day, I told you, I'm just dragged this thing out till, yeah. verse two, until the day in which he was taken up 
after he, through the Holy Spirit, was given, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after suffering by uh, many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So what's the point? After his resurrection, he kept appearing and reappearing to the 11 disciples and others outside of the uh, original group. He would appear to them over a period of 40 days. Pentecost means 50. So from the death of Christ to the day of Pentecost is 50 days. But he spent 40 hanging out with the guys. Which means there was 10 days that they had a prayer meeting. So he says, don't leave Jerusalem till you're clothed with power. I wonder what they did in those 10 days. <laughs> 10 days is a long prayer meeting. They already have been competing with each other, <laughs> thinking they're better than the other. So they, they got 10, it probably took them 10 days to get this stuff kind of fixed. <laughs> Just throw them in a prayer room and don't, leave, don't let them get out, you know? And uh, the, Peter, you know, he already said, I love, I love you more than all these. And so Jesus showed up, said, do you love me more than these? And so they had a few things to kind of work out in this prayer meeting. It's interesting, Jesus actually appeared, the scripture says, to f over 500 people announcing what was to happen. We don't know how, long, how many people were in the room when the prayer meeting started, but we know 10 days later there was 120. What, were they, what did Jesus talk to his disciples about during the 40-day period? The kingdom of God. That's the message. Being assembled together with them, verse 4, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. When they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord... <clears throat> Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said, it's not for you to know the times or season which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Twice the disciples brought up conversation and asked questions, and twice Jesus turned the subject to the kingdom of God and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There's a tremendous book. Um, I, we have copies somewhere. I, I'm going to promote one of these days. It's called The Cure of All Ills. And, you know, I, I did this study years ago on, um, on water. Uh, uh, rivers, uh, pools, uh, lakes, rain, those kinds of things. And it, it, the conclusion I came to is all through the Old Testament, Israel would have a problem with an enemy army. They would have a problem with moral breakdown in their own culture. They would have a problem with following after other gods. It didn't matter what the problem was, God's answer was rain, rivers, pools, which in that context is always the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So it was like, it, it's like, it doesn't matter what problem you have, what you need is God. It's a cure-all. In other words, there, there actually is a simple answer to every problem. You need an immersion in the Spirit of God. It doesn't mean you don't need counsel. It doesn't mean you don't need this, you don't need that. But what you need most of all, what we need, what I need, is an immersion in the presence because everything becomes settled. Everything becomes settled in the presence. Verse 8, he says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. Go to chapter 2 of Acts. Verse 1, 
When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. There's the miracle. Ten day long prayer meeting. <laughs> they are now in one accord. It's awesome. And suddenly, it's interesting, suddenly there came a wind. But the suddenly came after 10 days. Before heaven invaded earth, earth invaded heaven for 10 days. Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in their own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians, Medes, whatever that is. <laughs> Elamites? I don't know. Par parasites? I don't know. Those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, uh, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, all these places. Verse 11, Cretans, Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. All right, I, I am getting close to the end, I promise. They were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others were mocking. All right, here's, here are the, uh, you want to know what the signs of a revival are? Here, here are the signs of a revival. Verse 6 says they were confused. <laughs> Verse 7 says they were amazed. Verse 7 also says they marveled. Verse 12 says they were amazed and perplexed. Verse 13 says they were mocking. That's revival. doesn't mean you do stuff to be stupid and blame God for it, but when God has his way. Yeah. All right. <laughs> the angel comes to Mary and says, you're going to give birth to the Christ child. Well, how can this be? I'm a virgin. The spirit of God will come upon you. I mean, you know, when it happened, there was no external evidence. But eventually, <laughs> she couldn't hide what she was carrying. And every burning revivalist tries to conceal it for as long as they can until suddenly the work of the Spirit of God upon them is so obvious. Her privileged responsibility was to reveal Jesus to the world. Same as yours. How did it happen for her? The Spirit of God came upon her. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to in any way diminish the absolute significance of Mary and her surrender, the virgin birth. Stunning. But don't underplay the privileged responsibility that we have as believers to yield. Mary's natural, Spirit of God came upon her, produced Jesus. 
You are natural. The Spirit of God comes upon you, and Jesus is manifest. The second thing I want to point out in this part of the story, <clears throat> as we come to an ending, I keep, I keep threatening. <clears throat> the second part that, that is important for you to see is that these various nations, <clears throat> when they heard the 120 pray in tongues, they heard different ones speak in their languages. And it says, they heard them speaking, verse 11, of the mighty deeds of God, the wondrous works of God. So the people that were praying in tongues didn't know what they were saying. But the people who heard them, heard them speak of the mighty deeds of God. When you pray or sing in the spirit, you are declaring the mighty deeds of God. He who speaks an unknown tongue doesn't speak to man. He speaks to God. <clears throat> it can be an intercessory prayer and or it can be declarations of praise. <clears throat> I was talking with my mom this week about an experience that part of our family had, goodness, 100 years ago, literally. <clears throat> when my... <clears throat> When my grandmother and um, I think it's one of my mom's aunts, <clears throat> when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they wrote in perfect Chinese. And I, one thing I didn't know till this week in my conversation with mom, <clears throat> my mom's 94. <clears throat> and she told me that, that uh, I, I knew this part. One of them, a missionary came in, it was the old ancient Chinese language, <clears throat> which, which they didn't know, you know. And they wrote in perfect Chinese. So a missionary comes to town that was able to read the ancient Chinese language. And the first one he read was all praise to God. This is what I learned this week. The other one that he read from one of my other relatives was it was the 23rd Psalm in, in, in Chinese. <clears throat> now, Writing in another language is not on the list. But the lists of scripture don't contain God, they reveal him. God doesn't corral himself with the list. He reveals himself with the list. So what we see is they're speaking of the mighty deeds of God in foreign languages. And then a hundred years ago, got relatives that wrote in a foreign language and did the same thing, speaking of the mighty deeds of God. Wow. It's not on the list, but is it consistent with the list? Yes. See, learning the ways of God that are revealed through his lists helps us to be able to discern whether or not something's from the Lord or not. Some people look at the list and it's the externals. And so they only end up with recognizing Jesus if he appears the way he did when we walked together for those three and a half years. But when he reveals himself differently, you have to recognize him by presence, by likeness. All right. And this is where I'm going to end. I, I promise. You know what? I am closer to the conclusion than I've been all night. I am. That's, that is a fact. That's not even an exaggeration. It says in verse 6 again, when this sound occurred, multitude came together. <clears throat> when this sound occurred, I grew up thinking that people, thousands of people, if you, it's nine o'clock in the morning. We got moms playing with their kids. We got 
you know, people in their carpenter shop doing their work and, you know, all the agricultural teams, they've got their animals ready and nine o'clock in the morning and they just, all of a sudden in Jerusalem, they just, they drop everything and they start following a sound. I grew up thinking it was the sound of people speaking in foreign languages, but that's kind of silly. It's an international city. They've got people talking in foreign languages all the time. Now, let's be honest. Reading's not the most international city until you guys showed up. <laughs> and now we've had like a hundred and some nations, you know, living here with us for a season. So, but even, even in a non-international city that has you come, you stand down there on the street corner on Pine Street and you have about 10 people speaking in Russian, you're not going to have a city drop everything they're doing to come and stand around you because it's not the sound of a foreign language. It's another sound. What is it? It said a sound came from heaven. A sound came from heaven. The best way I know how to illustrate this Uh, one of the instruments that I, uh, musical instruments that I, I love so much, if it's done well, <laughs> which is my prerequisite for all instruments. <laughs> Sorry. No, okay. Sorry. I, I, actually, I take that all back, although it's true. <laughs> we, we, have, we have, I can say it here because we have so many incredible musicians. Honestly amazing. But one of the instruments that I, I enjoy so much is the saxophone. Yeah. Oh, goodness. A good, a good saxophone. Just, just listen, listen to me now. I'm, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you've got that, there's, it's a reed on the mouthpiece of a saxophone. And that skilled artist breathes across that reed and it goes down this brass instrument or whatever metal it's made of and it amplifies and projects that sound. It's just, it's extraordinary. But it's breath across a reed. I'd like to suggest to you, 120 people finally got in tune. It took them 10 days, but they got in tune so God could trust them with a sound to move a city. And it says, a sound came. One of the words that can be used for this word sound is a roar. A roar came from heaven. Now remember, we've got 120 people, individuals to the max. And as we know by our own experience, you can be in a group of people that you really love and care for, but we often have our own agendas. And 10 days of prayer together yeah. pretty much worked all that stuff out. So now we have everyone tuned to the same sound. In an orchestra, you can have instruments tuned to each other, but they can be completely out of tune from what is a proper sound. They sound good together, but they don't sound with authentic music, authentic sound. So what they do is they take one like a tuning fork, and all the instruments tune themselves to this one thing. How do these instruments get united? Not by working on unity. They get united by tuning their heart to the one standard. Everybody adjusts to the one thing, and they find themselves in tune with each other. I believe in unity, but sometimes... We're tuned to each other, but not to him. Yeah. Unity for each other actually starts with a unity with him. I surrender to you. Yeah. I embrace your sound. So here's 120 people over 10 days adjusting their instruments until they're all tuned to the one sound. And then the roar from heaven comes across the hearts of 120 reeds and a sound is released over a city that where people dropped everything. There was a sound that summoned them. It was more than a musical sound. It was more than, than 
tongues or foreign languages. It was something other. It was something else. And people start, start wondering what they're doing with a plow in their hand, what they're doing, you know, with the, the toys of the children, whatever. The, everybody drops everything, and thousands and thousands and thousands of people start flocking to where there's 120 praying. And they're standing there bewildered. They're mocking. They don't understand. They've got 120 people that appear to be intoxicated. It's not the best way to present the gospel the first time out. (laughs) But apparently it was. The disciples didn't know enough to influence that first meeting. So if there's any meeting that was completely governed by the will and purpose and presence of the Spirit of God, it was the first one. And what many people say can't happen, shouldn't happen in meeting, happened in this one. And it's the one he was in charge of, and we've got to vote ever since. And so here they are, 120 people. And suddenly, a roar comes. And they look around the room, different ones are spontaneous combustion (laughs) as they explode in the fiery languages of heaven, the tongues of men and of angels, and are speaking of the mighty deeds of God. Who knows how long it went on. Finally, the city begins to gather. Peter collects his thoughts. And he said, the prophet of Joel announced this day. And then he told them the passage out of the prophecy out of Joel. It'll come to pass in the last days I'll pour my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, old men dreams. On my maidservants, men servants, I will pour out my spirit. They shall prophesy. Day of Pentecost. 120 people. Is there any record of any of them prophesying? Is there any record of visions? Is there any record of dreams? No. No. What did happen? Fire, wind, and tongues. And Peter says, this, from Joel, is that, the 120. It's not about the list. It's about the manifestation of presence that demonstrates the lordship of Jesus over surrendered people. Eventually the visions came, eventually the prophecies. But Peter saw it in its embryonic form. And he said, this is that. Why don't you stand? Oh, goodness. I could charge your rent tonight. <laughs> I haven't talked that long in a long time. It's your fault, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're very kind. Here's the deal. Maybe you should have just done this. It would have lasted about two minutes. <laughs> Don't be drunk with wine. Don't live under the influence of something artificial. Live under the intoxicating influence of the fullness of the Spirit of God in your life. Be filled. Let's come in.
So ask him. It's not a one-time experience. It's an ongoing, it's a lifestyle of yieldedness to the working of the Holy Spirit. I need it as much today as I did 50 years ago. I need it more today, actually. So ask him. Timid prayers get timid answers. Holy Spirit, come. Come. A fresh baptism. A fresh baptism for every person, every person. You're welcome to stay right where you are and pray. We're going to take some time for this. But there are some of you that you are so unusually stirred, you actually need to just come down to the front. And so just just come down to the front. Uh, don't do it because somebody else is. Just there's an unusual stirring in your own heart. So come. Kneel or stand, do whatever, but just come. Come, Lord, fresh baptism, fresh, fresh baptism, fresh baptism, fresh baptism, fresh immersion, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled, filled with the Holy Spirit, be filled with the Holy Spirit, be filled with the Holy Spirit, be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled. Be filled. Be filled. Filled with the Spirit. Filled. Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Filled. Be filled. If I could get some, some of our team that aren't up front, uh, just walk around this group and just start laying hands on people and just, just declare over them, be filled with the Spirit, be filled, overflowing, overflowing. Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit, full and overflow, filled with the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled. We can have some more of our team just laying hands on people down here, but also th throughout the room. We're just, uh, we're just all in a place where we're just, we need more. And I feel like tonight is the night for more. And so we want to... The, the Bible uh, declares that we seek him while he may be found. It's not, it's not that he can't always be found, but in measure... There are measures where there are certain moments where he is more available. And I just feel like tonight is one of those moments. So obviously if you need to go, no, no shame in leaving whatsoever. But if you're able to stay and take some time to pray, come down here in your seat, wherever is fine. But I, I want uh, our team to just start laying hands on people and praying. Just be filled, very simple prayer, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you, it helps, it helps if that's your cry. You know, uh, the 120 had no clue what it looked like. They just prayed for what he promised. So right now, you and I can pray. God, you promised this. In fact, scripturally, it's twice it's called, at least twice, it's called the promise of the Father. So we ask right now for the promise of the Father 
the promise of the Father, the baptism, the fullness of the Holy Spirit to be released afresh over us as a church family, over us as a school of ministry, over us, our network of churches, those who uh, watch online. I pray the same in your homes right now, that there be a visitation of God, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the homes all across, all across this network of believers, that we would discover what it is to be full of the Holy Spirit, overflowing with presence, overflowing. Some of you are standing next to get uh, next to each other. You can just turn and pray for each other as well. Uh, it's very appropriate. Just you turn to somebody, you know, maybe husband, wife. I don't care what it is. Just turn to someone. Just pray. God, fill them with your Spirit. Do something significant in and through them tonight. We pray, Jesus' name. Jesus' name. We ask for the more that's been promised. The promise of the Father, we declare. The promise of the Father. Thank you, Lord. The promise of the Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Some of you, I think, are being marked by the Lord for divine encounters in the night. There's, there's at least a small handful that will be awakened in the night sometime this next week with an un overwhelming sense of his presence. All you need to do is just surrender to what he's saying and doing. Welcome him, welcome him to come and do as he pleases. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Increase this, God. Increase this, Lord. Get the keys up a little, little bit higher. I want to be able to hear them. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Increase this, Lord God. If, if God is touching you in a real unique way, then you just lock yourself up in that. But if, there's, if that's not happening, then just put a hand on somebody next to you and just pray. God, give it to them. Let there be a mighty, mighty display of your presence, your power upon this friend, upon this person. Yeah, it's, it's uh, so many things are supposed to happen, not just individually, but corporately. And that's always been a mark of this house is that there are corporate anointings. And we, we uh, celebrate that, God. We do, we celebrate that. Yes, Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Lord. Yep, yep. Increase. Increase, increase this, Lord. Increase this love. Thank you, God.
you know this, sing it. Spirit of the living God, fall on me. Spirit yes, of Lord. the yes, living Lord. God. Yes, Lord. Yes, God. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Wonderful. 
Jesus. Wonderful Jesus. Wonderful Jesus. Wonderful Lord Jesus. Wonderful God. begin to speak of the wonders of God, his wonderful works. Give him, give him praise. You are a wonderful Jesus. You are great. You are glorious. You are Lord of all. The reigning king. Majesty. 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 You are the magnificent one. in 
majesty forever forever i am changed by your love in the presence of your majesty we're singing Touch my heart like you do, and I could search for all eternity, Lord, and find there is none like you, cause there is none like you. Touch my heart like you do. I can search for all eternity, Lord, and find there is none like you. We're going to sing that again. I love that old chorus so much. I want to draw your attention to something, though. The house of God is called the gate of heaven. What happened in Acts chapter 2? They began to worship in other languages. And there were two natural manifestations that took place in the upper room. One, there was the sound of a rushing mighty wind. Two, tongues of fire. How are angels described in Hebrews chapter 1? 
ministers of wind, ministers of fire. The 120, the house of God, built on the edge of two worlds, cooperated in worship. They didn't command angels. They cooperated in worship and became the vehicle through which a heavenly sound accompanied by angelic reinforcement was released into a city that brought thousands to Christ. Is anybody getting the picture here? Every time we come together, not with our agendas, but yielding, yielding. I pray that this is the season. We learn to say yes to the Spirit of God at a whole new level, at a whole new level. Not just in our corporate gatherings, but day after day after day after day, night after night after night after night, yielded to the Spirit of God. Because there, there is a sound. The Father is about to breathe across the yielded reeds of the 120 once again, releasing something over a city. It's an angelic reinforcement that is released to render service for those who would inherit salvation. That is the Bible. So I want us to sing this song again. I want you to understand what's happening. We're driving a stake in the ground at another level, driving a stake in the ground. Just pray in tongues, pray in the spirit for, for just a couple minutes. If you don't have that gift, just ask for it. Jesus. 
Sing it again, there's none like you.
begin to pray in the spirit. Just begin to lift up your heavenly language right now. flow out of your inmost being. this prayer that Bill opened with over each other right now. We're going to pray Ephesians 3, 18 over each other as we, yeah, just linger in his presence, our beautiful online family joining us still. <laughs> Ephesians 3, let's pray this over person to our right, to our left now, may you be able to comprehend with all the saints <laughs> what is the breadth and length and height and depth to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you will be filled to all the fullness of God. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Filled with the fullness of God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. How many of you feel full? Wow. To overflowing. Wow. Wow, wow. Beautiful, beautiful night. Thank you, Bethel TV, Bethel Church, for following us. Hallelujah. That was a good time. That was a great time. I, how many of you were undone? Bill looked at me. He goes, well, I'm done. I said, well, I'm undone. So, okay. The breath of God, just yielding to him, everybody. Amen. It's the season we're in. Thank you, Billy and Peter, for leading us so beautifully. God bless you guys. Just be filled with the spirit. Overflow everywhere you go. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great night.